My parents died in an automobile accident shortly after I was born. The probate court decided that I was to be raised by my mother's younger sister, my Aunt Lily, in accordance with my parents' will. My aunt, barely an adult herself, just 21 years old, was my only living relative. Little did the court realize that Aunt Lily unfortunately lacked the necessary knowledge, experience and most importantly, attitude to raise me like a normal boy. That's not to say that Auntie raised me poorly, only much differently. I'm sure the reader will better understand as my story unfolds. Auntie had herself been brought up in a fatherless household. My grandfather had run away leaving my grandmother to raise their two young daughters all by herself. Granny, after her husband left her, became a very disillusioned and spiteful woman, hating all men and teaching her two daughters that men, as a gender, should never be trusted. Somehow my mother overcame grandma's teachings, met my father, got married and had me. Aunt Lily, on the other hand, accepted my grandmother's opinions as fact and never dated, remaining, to my knowledge, a virgin. She was from the old school. This meant that I wasn't allowed to play with the other children if the group included any boys and even certain girls of whom she didn't approve, namely those who were impolite, rude, rough, loud-spoken and or aggressive by her standards. Over a period of just a few years she excluded every normal boy from my small circle of friends. This eventually excluded all the children since those she didn't drive away choose not to play with me. Aunt Lily, by today's standards, raised me to act more like a girl than a boy. The kids thought of me as a sissy. By this I mean, sensitive, polite, courteous and obedient to my elders, a special females. This exclusion from having any friends my own age fostered my desire to be with adults as much as possible since they were more receptive towards my sensitive nature. Of course this really meant adult women since I seldom encountered any adult males except as tradesmen or the husbands of my aunt's friends and most of the time I was shielded from them by either the maid, the cook or my aunt. I always wanted to be with the adults, especially my aunt and her lady friends. I discovered, at an early age, that being with women was more interesting. In some other ways my aunt allowed me freedoms that other children never experience. I never went to public school. Our inheritance allowed Aunt Lily, a certified schoolteacher, to quit her job in order to channel all her efforts towards my education and upbringing. Obviously this one-on-one -on -one relationship meant we spent most of our days and evenings together. I was therefore further ahead of students my own age and well-versed in subjects about which they knew very little, if anything. I studied the classics, art, poetry, literature and foreign languages. Social graces, courtesies and manners were always a daily part of my education. In addition, I gained a working knowledge of the finer arts by joining my aunt at concerts, plays, art exhibits and poetry readings. This made me more aware of adult female interests and assisted me greatly whenever I conversed with them. If sociologists are correct, then my environment was the reason I became what I am today. In my early childhood years, Auntie kept careful watch over me in order to shield me from what she considered negative influences. This meant I was never far from her sight. Where she went, so went I. This even included those special women's places that males dare not venture into for fear of being embarrassed. Each week, Auntie spent part of her leisure time at the beauty shop having her hair styled and her nails manicured. When she went, so did I. While she was having her hair done, I would sit quietly, watching how the women were transformed by the scissors, combs and brushes. The fantasy of being fussed over and pampered at the hands of an adult woman enhanced the warm glow I felt just being there. Even at my age, I thoroughly enjoyed listening to their feminine slanted conversations. This was their special domain, free of any intrusion by males. A place where the women could let their hair down and speak openly on subjects they wouldn't dare talk about in front of their husbands. I learned many things about the inner workings of the female mind while waiting for my aunt to have her hair done. In department stores and fashion boutiques we would browse the finer dress and lingerie departments hand in hand. Whenever auntie went shopping for dresses, skirts, blouses or even lingerie, there I was, in the dressing room, sitting on the floor, with auntie standing over me. Aunt Lily for all her male-hating was still a very beautiful woman with excellent tastes in clothing and always enjoyed looking her best. She once explained her attitude as, I dress to please myself, no one else. 
Secretly, I think she enjoyed being admired by males so she could put them in their place, as she often did. Auntie never felt uncomfortable letting me see her try on clothes, or in different states of undress. If a snooty saleswoman dared to look askance, my aunt either left the store immediately or asked for another saleslady. This closeness between us didn't change like it does for most boys until I was just past my twelfth birthday. At which time, she finally decided I was too old to go along with her inside these special places for women only, not because she was ever embarrassed, but because the other women in the dressing areas were becoming nervous by my presence. I didn't realize till much later in my childhood how these shopping trips with my aunt would help me. She must have suspected, even though I myself didn't at the time, that I really enjoyed these excursions with her into the world of women's fashions. Aunt Lily was very popular and had many friends. When we visited the homes of her female friends, I of course, went with her. She never left me in the hands of a sitter and also felt that it wasn't the responsibility of either the maid or the cook to watch me. Her lady friends eventually came to accept my constant presence at all of their social functions, even when their own children, some younger than I, would be outside playing together or had been left at home in the care of a babysitter. In the beginning I would sit quietly and unnoticed, secretly listening to their conversations. Early on, Auntie had warned me never to speak out or to divulge anything I might have overheard. As the women gained confidence that their conversations would remain private their fear of my exposing their secrets lessened and finally disappeared altogether. As I grew a little older I was allowed to leave my chair and play with my miniature cars around the dining room table, never far from where Auntie sat, while the women talked. If their husbands were in attendance, they always adjourned to the family room and the kids went out to play. No matter whose house we were visiting the ladies stayed and talked while the men left to watch TV or play cards. After a while, involved in their conversations, they would totally forget I was crawling around the floor at their feet. One day, after Thanksgiving dinner and the cleanup had been competed, I was once again on the floor playing with my toys. I must have been about seven at the time. One of my toy cars accidentally rolled under the long dining table completely out of sight. The women, all dressed up in their best holiday outfits and totally relaxed after the huge meal, had moved to the far end of the table so they could talk without being disturbed by the men who were again watching an endless series of football games. Not wishing to interrupt my aunt or her friends, I gently lifted the drape of the lace tablecloth and silently crawled under the table from the end opposite from where they sat. It was difficult to see where my toy car might have rolled because the tablecloth blocked out most of the light. After my eyes became accustomed to the semi-darkness I began to search for my lost toy, crawling from one end of the table towards the other. Being extremely careful not to bump into any outstretched legs, I crawled through the forest of nylon-clad legs stretched before me towards where I supposed my toy had rolled. Suddenly my progress was blocked by two sets of nylon-clad legs ahead and also behind me. Having nowhere to go, I was forced to sit and wait until my escape route reopened. Bored at having to wait, I looked around and inadvertently discovered I was able to see up the casually splayed legs of the two women on either side of me. Slipping lower to the carpet enabled me to easily see up past their spread knees, beyond where their nylons met the garters, all the way to where their thighs joined their bodies. A flashback of a previous visit with my aunt to a store dressing room enabled me to recall the name of the garment to which the garters were attached, a girdle. Most of the women, I later realized, didn't really need the benefits derived from a girdle, they just never dressed up without wearing one, Auntie later told me it was a southern thing. At my young age, seeing up their legs wasn't sexy, but instead, humorous. Covering my mouth so as not to laugh and thereby give myself away, my eyes strained to see between one woman's open thighs and the other's. Looking under their casually displaced skirts, I was spellbound by the two different styles of girdles, slips and panties they wore. In my mind I tried to remember which women's legs were displayed before me, unsuccessfully. Unable to contain my admiration for the beautiful lace on the bright red slip worn by the woman to my right, I gingerly stretched my fingers out to touch it. Finding out that I could safely do so without being discovered I further availed myself of the opportunity, running my fingertips gently across the silky smooth material. This was the first time I had ever touched women's undergarments. Oh, how wonderful it must feel against their skin to wear such beautiful underclothes. 
I silently mused. I continued my examinations of the two women's lingerie touching the material whenever a safe opportunity became available. When my path finally reopened, I decided I needed to see more women's underwear. Silently sliding across the carpet, from chair to chair, I studied each woman's lingerie in turn, making mental notes on how the garters attached to the welts of their nylons, the different patterns, shades, and colors of the hose and how when a woman crossed her legs her naked underthighs became exposed. I investigated the different lace patterns on each of their slips as the back portions dangled before me. The bright colors, while muted by the diffused light, entranced me. Each lady was different enough in the way she sat and what she wore to fascinate me. I didn't understand, at that tender age, why I was mesmerized by the sights before me, I just was. Knowing I shouldn't be there and nervous about being discovered, I began to turn around to make my escape when I gently bumped my left hip against the dangling pump of one of the women as she adjusted her position. I heard her say to her friends, I'm sorry, I hope I didn't hurt whoever I just kicked. There was a momentary pause and then, when they realized she hadn't kicked any of them, all eight women, including Auntie, reached under the table, lifted the cloth and peered into the now brightly lit area. I had just enough time to turn my eyes towards the carpet, acting as if I was searching for something. Young man, what are you doing down there? One of the ladies asked in a most suspicious voice. Yes. What are you doing under the table? demanded another. Trying to look and sound lost, I directed my answer towards my aunt. Auntie, my red car rolled under one of these chairs and I couldn't find it because there wasn't enough light to see anything when the tablecloth was down. Please, could someone help me find it? It's my favorite. By chance, I had not only given the perfect response, but I had been polite in doing so. Obviously, the women concluded, if it was too dark to see my car, it was too dark to see anything else. They were immediately placated, a few tittering at themselves because they had jumped to their supposed mistaken conclusion that I was rudely staring up their legs, even though I really was. To make amends to me but even more so to my aunt for implying that her nephew had been rude, they helped me locate my lost toy. One woman discovered that it had rolled against her char leg, obviously hidden from my view. My age, the lack of light and their finding my toy reassured them that I was absolutely innocent of any possible wrongdoing. Politely thanking them for their help, I crawled out from under the table, whereupon those that had been my initial accusers offered me a hug and a kiss on the cheek. As I left the immediate area, I overheard one woman state. We must have been acting paranoid to even suggest that young Robert was being rude. If it had been anyone else's child, including my own two sons, it might have been true. Robert, however, is the most polite and courteous young boy I've ever met. Lily, you should be very proud of the way you've raised him. He's a perfectly mannered young southern gentleman. I wish my sons were more sensitive like Robert. It's so hard today to raise a boy to be refined. They have somehow picked up the mistaken idea that manners are for sissies. He's also the prettiest little boy I know. He's sure to grow up into a handsome man. Well, maybe I'll be lucky and he'll be my son-in-law one day. My daughter could sure do worse. That night, in my room, I reconstructed the incident in my mind, discovering that I enjoyed fooling the women and that I liked looking up their skirts. What I came to realize was I liked seeing and touching their attractive lingerie. I liked the different colors. I prized how pretty each woman's slip looked with its shiny colors and its lace edges. I especially enjoyed the sounds their nylons made as they crossed and recrossed their legs. The last thought I remember, before sleep overtook me was, I sure wish I wore pretty clothes like my aunt and her friends do. That wasn't the last time I crawled under the table to stare up women's skirts. Any time the ladies got together I would invent a reason, if caught, to be under their chairs. Most of the time I went undiscovered. Whenever I was careless, the worst that happened was my being asked to get out from under the table and play somewhere else. In fact, it got to the point where if someone did kick another woman's foot, instead of apologizing to her friend Ethie apologized to me, even if I wasn't under the table. Whenever this happened, the women would snicker amongst themselves. Oh, sometimes one or another might remember I could be down there and modestly adjusted the drape of her skirt or the way she sat. But for the most part, they either forgot about me, 
thought I was too young for it to matter or they never realized how much they exposed to someone lying up under their chairs. Again, let me remind the reader, I wasn't interested in seeing their bodies, just their lingerie. I had no knowledge of the subject of sex, or at this age, even realized that the genders were different. I just liked the way women's lingerie looked and wished I could wear pretty clothes like they did. Aunt Lily, during her weekly quests for new attire, began asking me for my comments upon her selections. Since she seemed to value my opinion I began to actively, yet secretly, study women's fashions. In order to do so it was necessary to understand the different materials, cuts, style lengths and colors of feminine apparel. The initial stages of my quest for feminine knowledge took the form of comparing women when they weren't conscious of my appraisal. I scrutinized the manner in which women dressed, how they walked, how they talked and how they carried themselves. I spent every possible moment of free time from my normal studies secretly scanning department store catalogs and my Aunt Lily's women's magazines, paying particular attention to the clothing, shoes and lingerie. I committed to memory all the various types and styles of feminine apparel. I studied any article describing the benefits of the materials from which women's garments were manufactured. In an effort to fully understand how these fabrics moved when worn, I also studied women and young girls. Naturally I took great pleasure in sneaking peeks up or down a woman's dress when an unguarded moment offered itself. Most of the time, the woman never even noticed me, but when a woman did catch me in the act, she usually dismissed it as the normal actions of a curious young boy, or possibly she may have considered it a compliment. As I assimilated each new bit of information I became even more aware of the various undergarments women wore to enhance their figures. The strangeness of many of these new garments caused my curiosity to peak. At first, I was totally confused, not being quite mature enough to discern why women would go through the discomfort, in my opinion, of wearing these strange items with all their straps, belts and padding. In an effort to learn more about these strange garments, I would sneak into my aunt's room and browse through her closets and lingerie drawers whenever I felt it was safe. During one of these intrusions I decided it was time that I learn the purpose or benefit women derived from these strange undergarments. Experience is the best teacher flashed through my mind. This was a motto I had often heard my aunt profess. Therefore, upon entering my aunt's bedroom, I took her advice and began slipping into my aunt's discarded lingerie. Selecting a bra, a pair of matching panties, a girdle, some sheer nylons, a slip, a dress and some heels, I cross-dressed in my Aunt Lily's clothes. I must admit it wasn't as unpleasant as I had suspected to wear these straps, belts or pads, just strange. When I looked at my reflected image in the mirror, I felt silly. I didn't look at all like I had presupposed I would. Instead, I looked just like a silly little boy dressed in his aunt's oversized clothing. Of course, my hairstyle was that of a boy. In addition, I had not thought to fill the bra cups, thereby lessening the effect and making the dress hang improperly. The outfit I had selected didn't match. The dress was too big. The slip fell below the hem of the dress. I hadn't used makeup or any jewelry to enhance my features. I also didn't use the knowledge I had learned as to how a woman walked or stood or gestured. The total effect was ridiculous. Even though the sensations brought about by the silky materials were definitely pleasurable, I still felt foolish. I did learn how the clothes helped enhance a woman's figure and since this was my initial purpose, I wasn't overly disappointed. Every now and again, I was struck by the desire to repeat my experiment. Each time I felt more pleased by the sensuousness of the clothing but still saw a young boy acting silly. Despite her having to educate me and our weekly shopping trips, my aunt found time to attend social functions aimed at furthering the cause of women in society. As a small child, my attendance was looked upon by the membership as perfectly normal. Auntie, for all her male-hating beliefs, or maybe because of them, was a respected leader of various women's organizations. Her wit, intelligence and organizational skills were considered a valuable asset. Being financially independent of any male enabled her to meet men as equals, thereby not being intimidated by them and eventually earned her a leadership role. As I was her child and always acted in a most proper manner, I also was welcomed, becoming somewhat of a mascot. 
Growing up, many of my opinions were directly influenced by concepts expressed by my aunt and her friends. I never felt that being polite was a weakness of character as most boys do. My proper manners, soft speech patterns and gentleness earned their complete trust. Aunt Lily often received compliments as to my genteel manners and deportment. This always brought a glow of pride to my aunt's features, bringing us even closer together. As most of the women belonged to many of the same organizations, I became quite familiar to them and vice versa. They eventually accepted me as a junior member of their organizations. I think they felt they could start their revolution by converting me. Therefore, I was privy to all their conversations and plans to further women's rights. I learned many of their feminine secrets. In addition, as their mascot, I was always being hugged, tickled, squeezed and innocently flirted with as part of my acceptance. As I was always around and more importantly, had available time, many of the women eventually felt comfortable enough to ask for my assistance with different parts of their clothing. I can't count the number of times, as a young boy, that I was asked to brush off their shoulders, button their blouses and back, check the seam of their hose or even center the zipper of their tight skirts. This afforded me ample opportunity to discover what a mature woman felt like under her clothing. It eventually developed into a game between the women and myself. I would actively search out opportunities to fix their clothing and they would challenge each other to expose more and more of their lingerie-covered bodies in an effort to see who would be first to refuse the dares. Those few who did initially refuse received such a chiding from their peers that eventually I was being asked to perform all kinds of personal chores for the women. This included painting their nails, both finger and toe, massaging their tired feet and calves and brushing their hair. Instead of hating these feminine chores, as most young boys would, I came to enjoy and look forward to them. As I matured into my teenage years, I realized how much I enjoyed their rituals of acceptance and sought ways to increase the number of instances that I was hugged, squeezed, flirted with and kissed. As my sophistication concerning feminine apparel grew, it became common knowledge to the membership. They began asking for my opinion or suggestions about the way they looked, how their clothes hung and if their hair was fixed properly. I was always careful to tell the truth, even when being negative, but in such a manner that I didn't offend. I also discovered how easy it was to be liked and accepted by my aunt's friends simply by remembering to offer an unsolicited compliment. Whenever I noticed a positive change in someone's hairstyle or dress I would tell her how flattering it looked, or how it made her look younger or thinner. This endeared me to them, again earning me numerous hugs and kisses which I enjoyed and used in my adolescent fantasies. As I grew older, the fantasies became more complex. Initially, I tried to picture myself as Lily. I attempted to insert my mind into her body, feeling what it was like when she dressed, walked and moved. I would envision her dress draped over my imagined breasts, drawn tightly across my firm derriere, as it swirled around my nylon encased knees when I walked across a room in my three-inch heels. I even imagined I could sense as my breasts bounced with each step. I pictured my smoothly shaven legs encased in sheer nylons and my arched feet tapping across the floor in high heels. I would visualize my maleness surrounded by her silk panties and my balls floating within the delightfully cool material. I did enjoy my illusions, but was always left wanting. Therefore, I was compelled to create new mental images. In these new fantasies, I became my aunt's daughter instead of her nephew. This was much more satisfying. Oh, how pleasant it would be to share our being female. We could spend our days and nights pursuing all the wonderful adventures my new identity would allow. Now I could wear the dresses and lingerie. Now we could share each other's clothes. Now we could go to the beauty shop, have our nails manicured and our hair styled while we eavesdrop on women's mysterious conversations. When we went shopping I could actually try on the dresses. I envisioned us girl talking over lunch, while being flirted with by the waiters and the male customers. If I was her daughter, she would no longer be concerned with being as modest in my presence, since we were both female. We would walk around the house in the briefest of lingerie and even naked, if that's how we felt. It was much easier to create new adventures while still staying within my own body versus taking over my aunts. The women became so comfortable with my constant presence that they seldom bothered with being overly modest when I was around. 
A few even teased me by purposely exposing their nylon-clad thighs and or their mature cleavage. They allowed me liberties which under other circumstances they would have a thought unladylike. I was free to tickle them, sit in their laps, rest my head against their breasts and at times, when they were getting ready to go out in march, see them in different states of undress. I was careful whenever this happened, thereby never exposing my newly developing desires towards them. I'm not sure if my aunt was ever really fooled but she never spoke about it. Of course the reader realizes this occurred over time. The women and I developed a special warmth towards each other, which I carefully nurtured and protected as I grew older and more aware. Maybe because they placed such a high value on how they appeared to the public and how they protected themselves from being embarrassed in the presence of males was what made me feel that I was special. As I said before, I was their mascot. One day, an important rally was to be held in the city park at which women's equality was to be championed by the combined memberships of the different women's groups. Unfortunately, for whatever reasons, few women were in attendance at the pre-rally meeting. Seeing the consternation on my aunt's face over the small turnout, I offered to join the ladies to help swell their ranks. At first this was rejected by most of the membership since I wasn't a female. They felt my attendance would be construed as if I had been forced to attend, therefore limiting the rally's effectiveness. During the discussion over my fitness a smile grew on my aunt's face. Getting the attention of the group, my aunt turned to me and asked, Robert, do you really want to help us? Would you be willing to do anything we needed done to make the rally more successful? Aunt Lily, I am prepared to do whatever you or the ladies ask of me. I rashly stated. Wonderful. What we need is more women at the rally. What I propose we do is dress you up as one of us, namely my niece. With the proper clothes, hairstyle, makeup and coaching you should easily pass as one of us. Even one more female will help the cause. If you really want to help, this is the best way. Are you willing to go to this length for us as you've promised, or are you a typical male, concerned with only your own agenda? This wasn't what I had expected. Looking at the hopeful faces turned towards me, I quickly realized this was a turning point in my relationship with my aunt's friends. If I turned down my aunt's challenge, I would never again enjoy their total friendship or trust. I would never again be safe in their eyes. Quickly, I decided that their acceptance and attentions were more important than any possible embarrassment I might feel being in public dressed as a female. Secretly, I relished the idea of wearing feminine attire, in public, with my aunt's approval. Nodding my head in acceptance, as I feigned embarrassment, I whispered agreement to my aunt's request. I will do whatever you need of me as I have already have promised. My response was greeted with cheers, followed by grateful hugs and kisses from all those in attendance. After the room quieted down, a discussion as to what was needed for my transformation was quickly decided upon. Three of the ladies were sent out to purchase or bring from their homes the clothes and other articles needed to transform me into Eve, a name they selected since I was to be the first new woman taken from a man just as the original Eve had been. Since we still had three hours before the rally was to begin, some of the women got on the phones and began calling other members who had said they weren't coming. They explained what I was prepared to do in the name of women's equality, thereby shaming many of the absent members into changing their minds and attending. This caused 28 more women to promise their support. As each new success was reported, I became even more of a hero or should I say heroine than before, earning the additional hugs and kisses. When the three women returned, their arms laden with packages, my gender transformation began. I was handed a pair of pink nylon panties and told to change into them. As I turned to leave the room my aunt stated in a firm, no-nonsense voice, Eve, there isn't time for you to be modest. We have too much to do. We not only have to dress you as a young lady but we need time to coach you in how to walk, talk and gesture properly. Just get undressed. All of us have seen naked boys before. Who do you think changed all those messy diapers boys make as babies? Now don't you be silly, do what I tell you. Whenever Aunt Lily spoke in that voice, I knew better than to argue. Within seconds I stood naked before the assembled women. Slipping one foot then the other into the lace-edged openings, I shimmied the tight panties up my legs, over my thighs, and around my waist. 
I immediately remembered the difference women's panties felt against my skin versus how my own male shorts felt. It was definitely a pleasurable sensation. My buns felt caressed by the cool material, while my penis and balls seemed to float within the cupping grasp of the silky crotch. The women noticed I was getting semi-aroused and began to giggle. My aunt, in order to save me further embarrassment, took charge. Aunt Lily directed two women to assist me in getting dressed while the others watched. A waist cincher with garters, then sheer nylons, a bra, a full white nylon slip with exquisite lace at the bodice and hem, a beautiful powdered blue silk button up the front flare dress and three matching heels were next. The hem of the dress fell just below my knees. One of the women had even remembered to bring a pair of false breasts back to the meeting that had once been worn by her mother after a double mastectomy. These had been inserted into the empty bra cups and dramatically improved my appearance along with giving me the proper sway, bounce and weight of real breasts. A long-haired blonde wig, nail polish, lipstick and makeup were applied. Clip-on earrings, a diamond watch, rings and a gold cross and chain were added. The effect was astounding. This wasn't like when I had crow stressed. This was for real. Looking at myself in a mirrored wall I was amazed at how these few items of feminine apparel when properly installed had significantly changed my figure. I was also impressed at how delightful properly fitted women's apparel felt. I now came to realize why my aunt felt so strongly that women were superior. I no longer felt like a boy dressed in women's clothes, I felt natural. I felt like a woman. The clothes felt correct. I felt correct. These few items made me feel pretty, sensuous and more alive, definitely not silly. The two women, of course, were totally pleased with themselves. They had transformed the ugly duckling into the beautiful swan. All three of us were complimented equally by the others. As time was now growing short, it was decided to forego teaching me how to speak in a more feminine pitch in lieu of practicing how to move as a female and how to sit most properly. Each lesson was an imposing challenge. The way my new clothes adjusted themselves to the way I stood, walked, or sat thrilled me. I had never realized the problems, nor the exquisite joys women incurred wearing their attire. I learned how to modestly cross my legs, how to adjust the drape of my skirt and how to gently swing my hips instead of my shoulders when walking. Throughout this coaching I never once lost the sensation of being female and more importantly, pretty. I now began to wonder how different my life might have been had I been born and raised as a girl. With each new example of the differences, I decided that I would have enjoyed being female much more. It was at that moment that my aunt took my hand and gently pulled me aside. Whispering, so the others couldn't hear, she stated. Enjoying yourself, aren't you, Eve? I've been watching you. You're elated being dressed as a girl. You like looking pretty. And you are pretty. Well, I'll let you in on a secret. I like it too. I think you look much better as my niece than as my nephew. And don't think you've been fooling me. I know you've been stealing into my room and wearing my lingerie and dresses. That's where I got the idea for you to crow stress in the first place. Exhilarating being a female, isn't it? How would you like to continue wearing girls' clothes with my permission and assistance on a full-time basis? If fact, how would you like becoming my niece Eve on a full-time basis? Just think of all the fun things we could do together that you can't share with me as Robert. How would you like to have your hair and nails done at the beauty shop like I do each week? How would you like going clothes shopping, entering the dressing rooms, trying on the pretty dresses, slips, blouses and skirts instead of just waiting outside while I do it? Think of all the fun we could have fooling people, especially men. Think of how it would feel being whistled at by men who think you're pretty. Think of how it would feel lounging around the house in the evenings in the most sensuous of peignoirs. Think of how it would feel going to sleep in sheer nighties and silken negligees. Think how much closer we could be if we were both females. Think of the two of us helping each other to dress in the softest and silkiest of sensuous lingerie. Think of how pretty you would feel not once in a while, but every day. You'd really like that, wouldn't you? Well, wouldn't you? I couldn't say anything at first. I was scared and at the same time trilled at the prospect of living my life as a female. Questions and answers flashed through my mind. 
for each concern about changing my lifestyle an opposing opportunity or delight overcame it. When I ran out of concerns and still came up with additional delights, I knew what course I wanted, no, needed to take. Throwing myself into my aunt's arms, I whispered softly in her ear. Oh, auntie, please let me become your niece. You can't believe how much I want it. I didn't realize until this very moment how divine my life could be as a woman. I can't believe how much satisfaction I derive from properly dressing up as a female versus a male. The clothes are wonderful, and you're right, I do delight in being pretty. I want to feel pretty every day. I never again want to be a Robert. I want to become Eve, your niece Eve. I'll do anything you ask if you'll help me. Hugging me tightly to her breasts, my aunt whispered. Make me proud of you at the rally and you'll get your wish. Now, don't say anything about this to the other women, at least until they see how successfully you cross over into femininity. I have a plan forming in my mind that still needs some refinement. Let's rejoin the ladies while I work out the details. The rally was a great success. My aunt brought me on the platform and promoted me as an example of who they were fighting for, namely their daughters and their daughters' daughters. The crowd of onlookers, not in the know, never suspected I was anything other than a lovely young girl who should also be given the opportunities that young men were afforded. I received a standing ovation. This brought a smile to my aunt's lips. When I performed a perfect curtsy, I was rewarded with a hug. Later when we marched back to the meeting hall I was the center of attention. All the women complimented me on my performance. I received more hugs and kisses, even from those who had not quite been certain I could carry it off. During the post-rally discussion one of the more mischievous of the women ventured the idea that they should cross-dress me for other upcoming rallies. This was the opening my aunt needed. Ladies, let me have your attention. I think the last speaker has the core of a great idea, but didn't take it to its natural conclusion. If Eve, see I'm already thinking of my nephew as my niece, is willing, and I'm sure she is, we can learn from this. This world will be a better place if all young boys were brought up the same as young girls. Wearing the same clothes and learning the same concepts of manners, courtesy and those social graces practiced by women almost exclusively. Then when they grew up, they wouldn't have the silly notion that they were superior to women or feel they needed to be macho. Women, after all, don't have this need amongst themselves. If the boys were brought up in this manner many of the problems between the genders would no longer exist. All of you have previously stated that you wish your own sons and in most cases husbands had better manners, were less aggressive and acted more sensitive towards women. How can they be, we as mothers have allowed them to be different? We have sanctioned their feeling superior. We could eliminate young boys thinking that becoming a soldier is a valid goal. Without soldiers, no armies, therefore no wars. Think how silly it would look fighting a war wearing heels and a dress. I know that's a bit extreme, but in Eve we have an opportunity to begin changing the system. Why don't we begin by changing my nephew permanently into my niece? We can use her to perfect our methods of training those males in our own families. I think it would be a big help towards furthering the goals of our organizations. From what Eve has told me as to how she enjoyed herself today I am confident she would be a willing partner in our plans. This may be our last real chance to change the world in our lifetimes. What do you think, ladies? At first there was stunned silence. Then one woman in the back began clapping her hands. Soon a second and then a third joined her. Within seconds the entire assemblage was clapping and cheering their approval of my aunt's idea. One woman offered a treasure of clothes left by her daughter when she went to live with her father. A second and a third also offered clothing. A woman who owned a shoe store promised that I could get all the shoes, bags and hose I needed at cost. Another, who owned a beauty shop promised me a complete makeover, including electrolysis. One by one they all rallied to the cause. Plans were made to take me shopping and to the beauty shop the very next day. That's how it all began. That evening, when we returned home, is one I'll always remember. During the ride Aunt Lily was silent. I was afraid I had done something to offend her, or she was having second thoughts about changing my lifestyle. Later, I found out I had nothing to worry about. 
Aunt T was simply formulating plans to herself. When we finally arrived, Aunt Lily directed me to sneak upstairs to her bedroom and wait for her to join me. There she had me stand at the foot of her great bed while she slowly walked around me, studying my frame in detail. She carried with her a small notepad and every now and again would jot something in it. When she was satisfied she had written down everything she needed, she spoke. Well, are you still desirous of becoming my niece? Oh yes, auntie, I can't imagine anything I want more. I exclaimed. All right then, here's how we'll go about it. I'll let it be known that I've become disenchanted with my nephew and sent him away to a private boarding school. There aren't that many people that know you well, outside the club, so your absence will be of little consequence. Then, after you've adequately learned your new persona, I'll introduce you as my niece Eve from your father's side of the family. Since he wasn't from around here, no one will know he had no family, nor will they make any connection between Robert and Eve. There are a few things, though, that will have to change around here. We will have to take Mary the cook and Sarah the maid into our confidence. Since I overpay them, and since they probably couldn't get better paying jobs anywhere else, I'm sure they will accept you as Eve. Knowing Sarah, as well as I do, she will probably enjoy the change more than you suspect. I'll tell you about that later. If they agree, as I'm sure they will, they will assist me in your transformation. That means that I will expect you to obey them whenever they offer advice concerning how you should act or when they correct you. In all other matters, they will remain the servants. Do you understand? I nodded my head in acceptance. Good. I will expect absolute compliance with my smallest wish, even if you don't understand why. When you were younger, you may remember, you received a spanking when you failed to measure up to my expectations. Be prepared for a repeat of those spankings for similar reasons. I cannot take the chance of some slip on your part causing me to be embarrassed. Any mistakes will be quickly dealt with. Knowing, however, how badly you want this transformation, I'm sure the spankings will be few and far apart. You will also receive rewards when I perceive that you are advancing at a quicker rate than expected. Your desire to become a female is obvious, however I have observed that your sexual leanings are most definitely towards women. I've observed you peering down the blouses and up the skirts of me and my lady friends. I consider this normal in an adolescent male. The desire to see a naked woman is very strong at your age. Girls your age don't usually have as strong a desire to view naked men, they're more interested in their own changing bodies. This is understandable since we women develop more interesting bodies. Don't you agree? Again, I nodded my head in agreement. Also, I've recently become aware that you've been staring at my dress while you lie on the floor as we watch TV and Sarah has recently mentioned that she's heard you outside her door. You've been peeking through the keyhole, haven't you? Don't bother to answer, it's true. This afternoon's adventure has probably saved you from a serious spanking. I was preparing to punish you for sins against the women of this household, but after your gallant performance and the success of our rally, I'm forced to change my mind. In fact, I find it ridiculous to entertain the idea of punishing you for acts that will become common occurrences in your new lifestyle. By that I mean, in order for you to become Eve you should have a working knowledge of a real woman's body. Therefore it will be necessary for you to see me, at times, in the nude. Let me warn you however, that I am not to be viewed as a sex object. If I catch you having more than curious thoughts over my nudity, the punishment will be most severe. I understand that initially you will most probably have an erection. That's to be expected, but later, I will demand you view my nudity as any other female would, namely, only for matters of comparison with her own. Sarah will assist you most intimately with bathing and dressing, etc., and she will have to decide her own feelings on the subject and also what liberties she may allow you. I don't suspect you'll have any desires to see Mary naked. Now take off all your clothes. My mind was a whirl. Not only was I going to enter the world of women, eventually as an equal, but I was to be given that which no male had ever been offered, that is, the opportunity to see my aunt without clothes. I still couldn't think of her as naked. Wasting not a moment, I began to disrobe. Now I discovered that this was more difficult than I expected. 
The dress was easy enough and so was the slip even though I later was taught to pull it over my head with my arms crossed versus dragging it down my body and then stepping out of it. Trying to remove my bra was impossible even when I first removed my breast prosthetics. This, of course, caused gales of laughter to issue from my aunt's lips. Not that way, you ninny, she giggled. Pull your arms out from the straps, then slide the catches to the front and then unclasp them. When I did as directed, I quickly understood why my aunt preferred front clasping bras. I also developed a problem with the garters and the hose. After I finally managed the garters I began to remove my hose, dragging them down my legs like a boy removes his socks. That's when my aunt spoke up. That's how I discovered that you had been wearing my clothes. When you cross-dressed in the past and removed my nylons in that same manner you stretched the fabric so badly that I no longer could wear them. I realized it couldn't be the other women in the household so it had to be you. I'm sorry I ruined your nylons, Aunt Lily, I didn't know any better. I suppose I should be punished? I meekly asked. We'll let it slide this time, she graciously replied. Removing the waist cincher was next. This presented no problem as it clipped in front. As I slipped the panties down my legs I felt my aunt's hands squeezing my buns and commenting that she hoped that hormone pills would flush me out where it was needed. She also studied my hips and the light brown trail of fuzz running from my chest, down my stomach, past my belly button and there joining the pubic hair at my crotch. Lifting my ball sack she continued her search for more offending follicles. It was done quite clinically and therefore I reacted just slightly. Auntie's hands now moved to my thighs and legs. There she discovered the early beginnings of coarse, darker hair. Rising to stand before me she stated. We'll need to give you a bath tonight and remove all your body hair. Since I'm not ready to present my new niece to the servants, I'll have to help you trim your mound. I wasn't prepared to be nude in your presence this soon, but I refused to get my clothes all wet either. Go in my bath and rent a tub and add plenty of my rose-scented bath oils and some of my bath bubbles. You'll find them on the window ledge. When it's ready call me and then get in. I'll be there shortly. I left the bedroom as directed. I had hoped to watch as my aunt disrobed, but obviously she wasn't going to allow that for now. Entering the bath, I did as directed. When the bath oil beads struck the water the room became filled with the sensuous scent of roses. Calling out to my aunt, I stepped in, sinking into the bubbles up to my neck. That's when Auntie walked in wearing only a pair of white-on-white, semi-sheer, silk panties. She was beautiful. I had never before realized how well endowed she was, her assets hidden under her clothes. My eyes were quickly drawn to the large pink nipples and the equally large rose-colored aureoles surrounding them. Looking up to my aunt's face I saw her studying my reaction. A blush of pride at my obvious enchantment formed upon her cheeks. A small smile of self-esteem also appeared. As she regained control, I quickly lowered my eyes to the silk-covered center of her womanhood. The panty material was sheer enough to see the small area of darkness directly above the outline of her nether lips. I had hoped to see her totally naked and while I was mesmerized by her firm breasts, I was still disappointed in that I wasn't able to see all of her femininity. It must have shown on my face. That's when she said, Disappointed are you? Okay, let's see if you deserve a reward. Stand up. I quickly rose, the bubbles gently sliding down my chest and stopping when they met those hanging below my waist, effectively blocking any view of my male organ. Brush away those bubbles, my aunt ordered. Wondering why, but knowing better than to ask, I did as ordered. There lay my maleness, shrunken by the heat of the water to a flaccid two inches. Meeting the cooler air, it began to naturally grow and rise as I stared at my aunt's ample breasts, but still at a slow pace. My aunt was surprised. She had expected me, after seeing her nakedness, to have a raging heart on. Her total lack of experience with men had never given her the knowledge as to what occurs when the male organ is inserted into a tub of steaming hot water. I realized it wouldn't remain this way very long and asked if I could return to the water as I was getting cold. Bravely, not waiting for her reply I again sank down into the enveloping clouds of bubbles. Aunt Lily paused for a moment and then said, 
I was willing to sacrifice these silk panties because I didn't want to have to look at your erection. Since you seem to be able to control yourself better than I expected, I see no real reason for getting them water spotted. You would eventually have had to see me naked anyway. With that statement my aunt slipped out of the last defense her womanhood had against my curious eyes. There she stood, a combined vision of Venus, Aphrodite and Diana. Flashing through my mind was the image of the painting September Morn and the thought of the men whom she had cheated by remaining a virgin. She was beautiful, no, more than beautiful, she was gorgeous. Thinking aloud, I stuttered. Why why you're gorgeous? Oh, I'm sorry Aunt Lily, but you are. There isn't a blemish or fault anywhere on your body. You're perfect. If I could one day look like you I would have all my fantasies fulfilled. I can't find the words to tell you what a vision of beauty and graceful femininity you project. Aunt Lily, whenever I've been really good please let my reward be to see you as you are now. If this were to be the prize, I can't imagine anything that I would work harder at in order to achieve such an honor. My aunt just smiled for a moment and then said, I'll decide what your rewards might be, but don't get disappointed, I'm sure you'll enjoy them. Now lift up one of your legs and I'll show you how to shave it. Pay close attention, you'll be doing the other one. After learning how to shave my legs, I learned how to shave my armpits and even the fuzz on my stomach and chest. Auntie explained that hormone pills would quickly eliminate most of my body hair, but for now we must do it the old way. It was at this point that my aunt reached into the tub and released the stopper. My first thought was the bath was over. As I began to rise I felt Aunt Lily's hands on my chest holding me in place. When the water reached just above my balls, Auntie replaced the stopper and climbed into the tub with me. She knelt between my spread legs, grasped my flaccid penis in her left hand and began shaving my pubic hair. The only thing that saved me from attaining an erection was my fear that the razor might slip. With a few deft strokes she reduced the hair-covered area to the same size as her own mound. As quickly as my fear diminished, that's how fast my member grew. Within seconds it had reached its full five inches. I sheepishly looked up at my aunt with an unspoken question upon my lips. Don't be concerned. I knew what to expect. I am glad however to see that you remembered my warning. This doesn't count. I expect you to become aroused when a woman touches your penis. I am surprised by its size for one so young. Yes, I know what size is normal. No matter what you may think you know about me, you don't know everything. Just as your mother did, I experimented with men when I was younger. I, unlike your mother, didn't enjoy it as much. If you must know, I prefer women. There, it's out in the open. That's what I meant when I alluded to the fact that Sarah might enjoy being naked in front of you. She's not only our maid, she's my lover, but she also enjoys men. Are you shocked? Pausing a moment to collect my thoughts, I replied cautiously. I don't think shocked is the correct word. More surprised than shocked. I often wondered how you controlled the urges I heard the other club women whisper about when they thought I was out of range. I assumed you masturbated just as they did. It certainly doesn't matter to me who you make love to, especially now. What little I know about lesbian lovemaking, it must be beautiful. Maybe someday, if I go all the way and truly become a woman in every way, I'll find out. I am shocked that you've experimented with men. I always thought you hated the very idea of sex with a man. I'll probably make you mad and will probably deserve a spanking for this, but I've always fantasized that one day your love for me would overcome your grudge against men and you would teach me the pleasures of lovemaking. Before you get mad at me, please let me finish. I've read that most young boys desire their mothers. It's called an Oedipus complex. Since I've never known my mother and since you've been more to me than most mothers are to their sons, I think it's natural that I would fantasize about making love with you. Please don't be too upset with me. Ha. 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 My aunt exclaimed. So you've been playing with yourself while fantasizing about me. I think that's wonderful. I have another confession to make, but before I do, let's dry off and slip into a couple of my nightgowns. 
pick out one of my bra and panty sets from my drawers, I'm sure you know which drawers I keep them in, fill it with your falsies, while I pick out the nightgowns. Wasting little time, I did as directed, wondering what my aunt had found so funny about my profession of desire for her. I had expected to be punished, but it seemed that I might not. I selected a soft rose-colored set of undies, inserted my breast forms, took the virginal white gown from my aunt's fingertips, slipped it over my head and arms, girlishly spun around, relishing the garment's sensuous feel as it floated around me and joined my aunt on the edge of her bed. Robert, I need to call you by your male name for the moment even though you look wonderful in my gown. I've also been distressed by a recurring fantasy-like dream of my own. It starts out with me questioning my reflected image in my dressing table mirror. In the dream, I'm asking myself if it's possible that I gave up on sex with men too soon. Maybe I just didn't find the right young male to share sex with because I quit after only two shallow experiences. Maybe I expected too much from my inexperienced lovers. I tell my image that it doesn't matter anymore since I'm now too old to start over again. My image replies that I'm only 35 and definitely not too old. It states, there are lots of men who would jump at the chance to have a relationship with you. Thinking I've won the argument, I snap back, all those men are exactly the reason I gave up on men before. All they want is to use me for their own satisfaction. Where can I find a male with the sensitivity I crave? Where can I find a male interested in satisfying my needs along with his? Where could I find a male who afterwards wouldn't boast that he was the one who had finally made it with the ice princess? Where? 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 It's at this point that my image begins to fade into that of a new face. It's yours, Robert. That's when I wake up. Now you know why I was laughing at your fantasy about me. Over the last six months, the dream has intruded into my sleep more and more frequently. I've come to the realization that I enjoy the dream and hope, each night, that it reoccurs. That's why I didn't punish you when I caught you staring up my skirts. In fact, sometimes I caught myself making it easier for you to see. When Sarah came to me with her discovery that you were peeking through her door, I felt guilt and jealousy at the same time. Guilt that I was leading you on and jealousy that you would switch your voyeuristic practices to another woman. I decided that it had to stop. That's why I was preparing to punish you after the rally. Now, have I shocked you? No, I'm still not shocked. What you've just said gives me hope that there's a real chance that my fantasies about you will someday come true. Don't you see, we both want the same thing. That's because we both love each other. We want to share that most precious expression of love between two people that can be shared. Forget about the stigma of incest. It's only there for two reasons. The first, to protect the woman from bearing an impaired child. In this age, there are sufficient methods to avoid your becoming pregnant. The second is to protect the minor from being used by the adult. If you think about it, neither one of us is using the other. You yourself, don't treat me as a child, so why would I need protection from someone who loves me as an equal? Besides, we don't have to do anything you find you're not comfortable doing with a male, after all, I no longer should be considered a male. We can be two females making love. If, after you've taught me how to be your female lover and partner, you want to fulfill the dream, we can share our love as man and woman. I will always respect your wishes and would never feel used by you. I love you as you love me. Eve, that's the sweetest and most endearing profession of sensitivity I've ever heard. You're right. Neither one of us could use the other. And you also write about our not needing to obey the precepts against incest. Those reasons are not valid in our circumstances. While you may be short a few years, according to social standards, your statements alone prove you're mentally and psychologically an adult. I know that I want you lying next to me tonight as Eve. Let's let what happens between us, happen. With that resolved, we turned back the covers, dimmed the lights and crawled into bed next to each other. It's not the reader's privilege to intrude into our privacy, nor will I describe what occurred between us in any detail. Let me simply state that I not only enjoyed the privilege of being taught lesbian love play, but just before sunrise, my aunt came to an enjoyable understanding of the fulfillment one can achieve in a heterosexual relationship. 
Late in the morning, with my aunt's arms wrapped around me, we fell asleep, cuddling like two spoons in a drawer. We didn't awake until noon, then lounged around the bedroom till about two o'clock, finally deciding to go downstairs and explain the situation to Sarah and Mary. My aunt helped me dress. I wore the clothes from the day before, only changing my undies. Only after my aunt was thoroughly satisfied with my appearance did either of us venture out of her bedroom. We silently descended the stairs to find the servants. Hearing muted voices coming from the kitchen we approached silently on tiptoes. Auntie had me wait just outside the kitchen door, cautioning me to be silent until she called for me. Carefully entering the room she discovered both Sarah and Mary relaxing over a cup of tea, discussing what possible reasons the two of us had slept together and why so late. So engrossed were they in their speculations, they didn't hear my aunt enter. Leaving the door slightly ajar, so I could hear the conversation, she moved closer, hidden from the servant's sight by the counter. Maybe the young master is ill? questioned Mary. If that were the case, why hasn't the mistress called for the doctor? Sarah replied. It must be something else. I just can't imagine what it could it be though. I think something strange is going on. Miss Lily doesn't even allow me to sleep through the night in her bed. Yesterday was also strange. When they returned from the rally, do you remember ever seeing Master Robert? I don't, stated Sarah. No, replied Mary. When they came in from the garage, the mistress called both of us into the den to talk to us about something and then changed her mind. I assume that's when her nephew went upstairs. I never saw him the entire evening. Miss Lily came down later and had me fix a light snack for the two of them, but she took it upstairs herself. Are you sure he even came home with her? Oh yes, he's upstairs and in her bedroom. When I went up to ask her if she wanted me to be with her last night, you know what I mean, I thought she might be in the mood, I overheard their voices through the door. When I knocked, Miss Lily didn't even open it. Instead she said my services wouldn't be needed. That's another strange thing, she didn't try to hide the fact that we're lovers from her nephew. Maybe she's finally told him about us and he's so shocked he won't come down. Mary interrupted. Even if she did finally tell him about you too, I can't believe he's upset over it. He loves his aunt too much. Besides, he knows we all love him, so there's no need for him to feel embarrassed. He's the sweetest and most gentle young boy I've ever seen. In fact, he's so sweet it's just too bad he wasn't born a girl. Sarah looked at Mary, then cautiously spoke. We both love the boy, but you're right, I think he would have been better off if he had been born a girl. Both you and I have discussed this topic before and so have I and Miss Lily spoken about it. She thinks exactly as we do, he would have made a prettier girl. If he was a female, it would certainly make my life easier in this household, yours too. We wouldn't have to be so prim and proper when he's around. I hope Lily did finally tell him about the two of us. I would prefer we didn't have to hide it from him. Haven't you also noticed that he has many feminine mannerism? Sometimes I think he loves Miss Lily so much he tries to copy her gestures. Every time I observe him being delicate and ladle-like I feel concern for him. I think he's going to have a very difficult time as a man. Do you think he may be turning gay? If that's the case, maybe I should take him to my bed and teach him about sex before that happens. You know, just to protect him from liking men. What do you think? Sarah, with a giggle in her voice, asked. That's when my aunt let her presence be known by saying, That seems like a strange concern from a woman who herself is gay, or is it okay for women to be lesbians and not okay for males to be lovers? Both women's heads turned toward where Auntie stood with her hands at her hips. Mary attempted to come to Sarah's defense by saying, we meant no harm, mum. It's just, we both love young Master Robert so much that we only want the best for him. You yourself have stated it would be better if this were only a household of women. Sarah, hoping to change the subject, inquired. Is your nephew okay? Is there anything you need of us? Master Robert isn't sick, is he? No, my nephew is definitely not ill. In fact, he's probably feeling the very best he can be. 
Ladies, let's get back to the conversation I overheard. So, you two would like it better if this was a household of only women, would you? Well, you're going to get your wish. My nephew is leaving us forever. In fact, he's already gone. In his place, my niece Eve is going to join the household. I'm sure you'll love her even more than my nephew, just as I do already. Oh, mum, you didn't send Master Robert away, did you? I love the boy. I didn't want him to leave. It's just the mumbling of an old woman wishing he had been born a girl. Quit your fetching. I'm sure you won't even miss my nephew. Here, let me call my niece so you can meet her. Eve, won't you join us? That was my signal to enter. Striding purposely into the kitchen, my heels tapping on the tile floor, I strode up to where they sat and politely curtsied to the two stunned women as my aunt beamed a smile at me. Sarah was the first to speak, Robert, it is you. You're lovely. I can't believe my eyes. If I didn't know you so well I'd never have guessed you weren't a girl. Then a sly twinkle appeared in the corners of her eyes and she said, Mary, we've had a trick pulled on us. How long have you two ladies been keeping this a secret? How long has Master Robert, I mean Eve, been dressing this way and what was she doing in your bedroom last night? It's obvious she didn't just learn how to put makeup on by herself or how to walk that way. Well, do we get to hear the truth? We spent the next two hours drinking tea and explaining everything that had occurred in detail. The obvious questions came up and we answered them, hiding nothing. When we finished, Sarah and Mary were as happy about the life I had chosen as were my aunt and I, both promising, more than once, to assist me in my transformation. They also expressed their happiness that my aunt had finally discovered how wonderfully fulfilling sex between the genders could be if the two people were right for each other. Neither one of the servants had a problem with us being related. Mary made all of us laugh when she quaintly lamented. This is the first time in my life I wish I were you, Sarah. You'll get to spend more time dressing and caring for the young miss than I will. Knowing you, I'm sure you'll teach her things that have nothing to do with being a lady dot. Before my aunt could respond, the phone rang. Sarah answered it, then handed the instrument to my aunt. It was one of the club members asking if we still wanted to go shopping as had been planned. My aunt made her apologies, stating that yesterday had been so exciting for the both of us that we were tired and wanted to rest. She promised we would reschedule soon and thanked her for the offer. Turning to me she said, I hope you don't mind, we'll still go shopping, I just didn't want it to become a circus. Is that okay with you Eve? Of course, auntie. I replied. Without further ado, we made our plans and left to go shopping for feminine apparel that would fit me better. Aunt Lily invited Sarah to join us. My aunt had decided to buy me an entire new wardrobe. Since I would be trying on mostly slips, skirts and dresses we decided to wear heels and hose. It also made my passing easier. We piled into the car and drove to the nearest mall. On the way we decided that it would be better if we three stuck together, thereby giving the saleswoman less chance to concentrate on me in case I made a mistake or someone became suspicious. As it turned out, we needn't have concerned ourselves, I passed with flying colors. It was one of the greatest days of my life. I went from store to store trying on and buying skirts, blouses, tops, pants, shorts, lingerie, shoes, belts and jewelry. We made sure we didn't buy too much from any one store so as not to raise suspicions as to why I needed so many new items for my wardrobe. The most fun was the lingerie departments. The colors and textures were simply marvelous and some of the exotic items brought a wondrous blush to my cheeks, which, of course, wasn't missed by either of the women. By this time, we were so pleased with ourselves concerning my ability to fool the various saleswomen that when we spied a free cosmetics seminar Aunt Lily suggested I take advantage of the opportunity. I was somewhat scared, but the two of them goaded me into it and when the young company representative also pressured me by offering to seat me in a partitioned area where only my companions could see, I reluctantly agreed. After taking my place on the tall stool, crossing one leg over the other and adjusting my skirt, as any proper young lady would do, the woman went to work. First, removing my makeup, she applied a new base, eyeshadow, mascara, blusher, and lipstick. 
Having Terry, that was the cosmetician's name, work on my features as she explained how and why she had selected the various products and shades felt wonderfully sensuous. I was putty in her hands. She even took the time to pluck out some hair from my eyebrows giving them an arched look, definitely more feminine. All the while my aunt listened most attentively, agreeing with Terry's suggestions and advice. During this process, I wasn't able to see my features as Terry worked on me. Finally, when she was finished, I was handed a mirror. The results were fantastic. Terry obviously knew her art. Where before I looked good enough to pass, now I was actually stunning. My aunt agreed that the products Terry had recommended were perfect for me and we purchased the lot, including additional items she suggested that would also work. Then, in a moment of total surprise, she softly whispered, Eve, here is my card, if you need additional help, I'll be happy to come to your house for a private consultation, free of charge. You needn't worry, your secret is safe with me. You're not the first male I've helped. I can also suggest a doctor who will prescribe hormone shots and pills which you'll need shortly, your facial hair is starting to grow and shaving is definitely the wrong way to go. In addition, the prescription will do wonders for your skin tone and might even help you develop real breasts. Call me at my home number if you want my help. Then bending she gently kissed my cheek and winked. I hadn't fooled her at all. However, what she was offering made me glad I hadn't. I thanked her for her kindness and promised she would definitely hear from me. Then, with a squeeze of my hand, we parted. My companions had overheard Terry's offer and when we were alone that's all we could talk about. Deciding that this was the high point of the day and our arms loaded with packages, we had already dropped some of our purchases off in the car, we headed for home. The shopping had been a complete success. Upon returning home we boxed up all my male clothing, hid it in the attic and placed all my new clothes into my dresser drawers and closet. It had been such an exciting day that when evening came I fell asleep almost immediately. In the middle of the night, I awoke in terror. I had dreamt that everything that had happened was just a lie. Even though dressed in a pink flowing nightgown, I was still confused and scared. Rushing to the door of my aunt's bedroom, I called out to her. As I stood in the open doorway I heard two feminine voices call out to me. Then I heard my aunt say, It's okay, don't be scared. Honey, come lie down between Sarah and I. Now I knew that I had been dreaming. Climbing over the foot of the bed I was welcomed into the warm reassuring arms of both women. Placing me between them we hugged and cuddled until I fell asleep wrapped in both their arms. That summer went quickly, I enjoyed all the experiences of being female that now opened up to me. I went to the beach in a lovely, slightly conservative two-piece suit and even developed tan lines. I went to the beauty shop owned by our friend from the club. Initially after hours, until my hair grew out and then during regular business hours. Oh, what a thrill! I called Terry. She came over and took me to the doctor she had mentioned at our first meeting. Auntie, of course, went with us. To my surprise, the doctor was a gynecologist and female. After a most thorough examination, the doctor, who was also a psychologist, specializing in rape and victim therapy, met first with me and then with all of us. Afterwards, she stated, In order for the Eve persona to become well-adjusted in adult society, you should officially change your name, destroy all your male gender clothing, dress in only feminine attire and be introduced as Lily's niece. The reason that I recommend this for you is that it will please you and thereby, even though you wouldn't really be a female, enhance your self-worth, self-image and your ability to survive in society as an adult. We quickly agreed with the doctor's recommendations, whereupon I received a starter shot of hormones and a prescription for pills. The doctor explained that since I was still in the early stages of puberty I could initially expect a conflict within my system until the new female hormones overcame the ones produced by my own glands. This would take about 30 days. After that my glands would no longer actively produce male hormones and in some cases actually begin to produce female hormones. This would cause my skin to become softer, my hips to flare out, my facial and body hair to become softer and less noticeable and my voice to become naturally feminine. Other effects would be a stoppage in the production of sperm and a less sensitive penis. 
The doctor assured me that while it would be harder for me to get an erection and longer between erections, I would still be physically able to perform insertion and I would still enjoy an orgasm, but without sperm cells in my fluid. A benefit of this was I wouldn't expose my true gender by getting an erection under my feminine apparel and I would last longer before I climaxed. She said it was a compromise I must learn to live with. I assured her it was a small price to pay to be a woman. Smiling, the doctor replied. Yes, isn't it wonderful being female? Getting dressed, we left the doctor's office and returned home. The next six months were a whirlwind of activity. For the reader's benefit, I'll highlight only those events which I remember as special. As a result of my gender switch I now took pleasure from fooling people. At first, I was naturally apprehensive and shied away from those few individuals who might know Robert from his past life. But as those unexpected meetings occurred and no suspicions were aroused, I became more comfortable. The few neighbors we had were easily convinced that I was Aunt Lily's visiting niece. Being a girl, on an everyday basis, enhanced my ability to pass and eventually all male tendencies and mannerism completely disappeared, I felt totally comfortable in my new identity. By now my hair had grown and was styled in a cute flip with bangs. I had developed 34 B-sized breasts, my skin had a softness and sheen like a young girl's, my hips had widened and my buns had taken on a feminine roundness. In addition my body hair had lightened and the vestiges of facial hair I had became a light peach fuzz and eventually faded away. All in all, my new life was wonderful. I was able to do and be all the things I had always desired. I especially enjoyed getting dressed each morning. Selecting my outfits not only for their appearance, but also for the way they felt against my newly developing feminine body. My relationship with my aunt was even closer. She spent uncountable hours teaching me all the little nuances of being female and a lady. We spent a lot of leisure time at the malls, not buying, just shopping. It was a great place to practice my training. Auntie and I enjoyed just being feminine together. I discovered I now enjoyed being noticed. Women and girls never saw me as a boy, now the opposite was true. Both men and women checked me over. The women for my appearance and the men for my body. I discovered the power a woman has over men just by crossing her legs or by adjusting her clothing. I soon learned the effect a casual smile or raised hem had on a male. There were of course, men too strong-willed and teasing them was dangerous. Both Auntie and Sarah taught me how to recognize those individuals and to act offended by their advances. On our shopping trips, I polished my teasing techniques till they became second nature. We went and did all kinds of things, which as a boy, had been closed to me. I was thrilled when the members of my aunt's club inducted me as one of them. To be a member instead of a mascot not only gave me a warm glow of pride, but also meant that they had totally accepted my transformation. By Thanksgiving, I had totally mastered being feminine. All my actions, speech patterns and facial expressions came naturally and were gender correct. I had grown into the role so well that I never even visualized my old self. Robert no longer existed. Having a dick inside my panties was the only aspect of being male I still enjoyed. I will admit, however, there were times I wished I had a real pussy.